Welcome to the final episode of White House Style, a four-week series of educational programming presented by Omore College of Architecture and Design. Omore is part of Belmont University, which is hosting next week's presidential debate. White House Style is part of the school's expansive Ideas of America series, which is going on through the end of the month. My name is Libby Calloway. I'm a former fashion editor and currently run a communications company here in Nashville. I also chair the advisory committee for Omore's fashion program. Before I introduce our guests for this evening, a couple of quick announcements. Omore and Belmont would like to thank the October 22nd debate sponsors, particularly HCA Healthcare, the City of Nashville, Nashville Convention and Visitors Corporation, and Rhyme and Hospitality Properties. The school is grateful to them and the many other sponsors listed on belmontdebate2020.com for making events like this possible. I also want to briefly thank all my previous guests, Lena Mann, Michael Smith, Adrian Miller, Rhonda Kamen, Lisa Donovan, Phil Krajak, Julia Sullivan, Lokalani Alabanza, and Charles Hunter III. You guys were amazing, and thank you for making the last three weeks so much fun and so interesting. Tonight's program was originally billed as first couple fashion, but over time it shifted to focus just on the first lady, whom during her time in the White House is easily one of the most photographed women in the world. Everybody wants to know what Flotus is doing and what she's wearing to do it in, putting her media coverage on par with even the most paparazzi celebrities. But unlike most celebrities, the first lady's clothes are rarely scrutinized at face value. Everything she wears can be politicized, judged for its provenance and its price. And thanks to our highly divisive culture, you can add another P word to that vetting agenda, partisan. Apparently some clothes say Democrat, some clothes say Republican. Because of this, much of her husband's, like much of her husband's policies, Flotus' style is always going to be contentious. Someone is probably going to have an issue with whatever she wears. Luckily, there are rules, spoken and unspoken, that dictate dressing for the White House, not to mention 231 years of historical precedence and many famous missteps that first ladies can learn from. The theme of this White House style program has been to demystify what happens behind the closed doors of the country's most famous residents. Tonight, as we look into first lady fashion, we'll explore those long held wardrobe rules and talk about how and where Flotus gets her clothes, who pays, and what happens when she's ready to clean out her closet. My guest and I will examine the effect a first lady's sense of style has on fa the fashion industry and American culture. Tonight, I am joined by two fashion world icons, one an award-winning journalist and author, another an internationally renowned designer and philanthropist. Both are respected industry leaders, voices of truth and reason, and living examples that kindness and fairness do exist among the fashion elite. In terms of our conversation, each of them has a different perspective to offer on first lady style. One is from the point of view of a critic and the other as an artist and a businesswoman, not to mention a frequent White House guest. Robin Gavon was recently named senior critic at large for the Washington Post. She came to the Post in 1995 to cover the news, trends, and business of the international fashion industry. In 2006, when she was the paper's fashion critic, she won the Pulitzer Prize for criticism. In 2009 and 2010, she wrote about Michelle Obama and the cultural and social shifts stirred by the first African-American family in the White House. Um, she is the author of The Battle of Versailles, the night American fashion stumbled into the spotlight and made history, and along with the Washington Post staff of Michelle, her first year as first lady. Diane von Furstenberg is a fashion designer, philanthropist, and founder and chairwoman of the company that bears her name. In 1974, she created the iconic wrap dress, which became a symbol of power and independence for women all over the world. She acted as president of the Council of Fashion Designers of America from 2006 to 2015 and served as its chairwoman from 2015 to 2019. In 2010, she established the DVF Awards to honor extraordinary men women. Her memoir, The Woman I Wanted to Be, was published in 2014 and has been translated into six languages. In 2015, she was named one of Time's 100 Most Influential People, and the following year she received the, the FDA Swarovski Award for Positive Change. In last year, in September, she was inducted into the National Women's Hall of Fame. And as I mentioned earlier, she has been a frequent guest at the White House um, because what we're talking about, I couldn't resist sharing some of the images from Diane's visit during different administrations. 
I think right now we're showing pictures of her with Presidents Ford and Carter, Clinton, and Obama. So welcome, Robin and Diane. You guys here? Hi. Hi. Hello. <laughs> I'm so glad to have friends with me for this last one. It's so good to see you guys on the screen. It's very and nice to be here. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Um, before we dive in, I, I do want to say that this is a nonpartisan conversation, um, but we are going to talk about Michelle Obama quite a bit because, Robin, you read a book about her and because <laughs> she wore Diane's clothes while she was in the White House and still does. Um, in fact, Diane, she wore um, a DBF dress on the Obama's family Christmas card in 2009, right? Oh, I think you're, you're um, turn your volume okay on. Can there, you you go. there you okay. go uh, <laughs> no i i mean it was such a big honor because uh i went to the inauguration and it was one of the most exciting moments of being an american to be in dc for obama's uh, inauguration and then i had just reissued my very first dress and, and then she chose it for her Christmas card. And what you choose for your Christmas card is so important, right? You think about what the dog is gonna wear and the <laughs> pillow like, the pillow and everything. So I, I thought that was such a compliment. So I, I, I cherish that. And Annie Leibovitz, I didn't even know, but Annie Leibovitz took the picture. I think it was for Vanity Fair, I don't know. And so she sent me a print and that's how I found out. That's awesome. So she would wear, I know she, you never like officially dressed her, but she no, would wear No, no, but dresses. we did. We did. Oh, you we did? Had okay. her, yeah, right. we had her measurements and we did things, but she she bought things. I don't know, but right. she she wore quite a few, but, but that one for me was meaningful because it was the first Christmas card for her as a first lady. And when Obama became president, it was such such a moment mm -hmm. that well, yes, very much so. Very, and everybody was watching exactly what she was wearing. And I was, we were talking before. Um, she, so Michelle Michelle Obama wore vintage DV up as well, including this dress that I have on. I was thrilled a couple of years when I saw. But it, sometimes, but you know, sometimes I remake vintage. I mean, the oh print. oh. So the one she wore was not, I mean, it was, yes, it was the very first print I ever did. So that's uh -huh. a long time ago, but I yeah. reissue it. I re uh, okay, so I've got the OG. I'm, I'm excited to have the OG here. So. <laughs> <laughs> so when she did wear a dress of yours, like, would you see a spike in sales? Like when you reissued the chain link dress that she wore on the card, would, would sales I spike? Mean, I don't know. I don't know. But of course, I mean, yes, of course, I'm sure. I don't, I don't have specific. Right, right, right. So, you know, I, I was talking about a first lady comparing them to Hollywood celebrities earlier, but, you know, they don't normally borrow things to wear. And I think it's usually unless it's a big occasion, right? And Otherwise, there are a lot of... I don't think first ladies borrow, do they? No. I don't think they do. I, th I think that they buy things off the rack. And, and well, Robin, if, you were, yeah. if you were Nancy Reagan, you borrowed. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's uh, true. I mean, okay. Nancy Reagan uh, quite famously, um, you know, had a lot of uh, designer friends and she did borrow. Uh, and you are, you're not allowed to do so as, as first lady. Or if, mm -hmm. or if you do, you... Uh, if you wear them, you know, you sort of ha you have, they literally have to be borrowed. You have to give it back. And she was forgetting to give things back, let's just say. Um, yeah. And uh, that became a bit of a scandal. But in general, I mean, I think one of the things that a lot of uh, citizens uh, don't realize is that the first ladies don't have a clothing allowance. And so all of the clothing that they wear, whether or not it's, you know, the inaugural trousseau, if you want to call it that, or just what they're wearing on a day-to-day -day basis, all of that, they have, to, um, they have to fund it. And some of the pieces, obviously the inaugural gown, the inaugural day dress, those are pieces that 
uh, are donated to the Smithsonian or they end up in the National Archive. And in, under those circumstances, then they can actually, you know, sort of take something either for free or at cost uh, because those things are not going to be personally kept. They, they are considered essentially a gift to the country. Right, right. Got oh, you. You, speak, you speak so well. <laughs> <laughs> she knows what she's talking about. So um, you, when we had talked a couple of months ago, you were talking about your conversation with Laura Bush about fashion, about... Um, yeah, about um, I, I had one of the, the more uncomfortable interviews of my life with Laura Bush. Um, she was uh, preparing to donate her inaugural gown to uh, the First Lady's exhibition, um, which is at the Museum of American History. Mm -hmm. And um, in the course of that donation, she had agreed to sit and have a conversation about her style over the course of, I think at that point, it had been about two or three years in the White House. Um, and it was pretty clear that she wasn't super keen on having that conversation, but she was sort of doing it because she want, did want to talk about the, the donation. And one of the things that she said was that she was often really struck by how traditional a lot of people still expected the first lady to be. Yeah. And one of those signs was that whenever she wore trousers, she would invariably get letters from people who thought that it was inappropriate for the first lady to wear pants, even if the situation absolutely called for it. So, and to me, I thought that was, you know, a really fascinating sort of dynamic for the first lady, this person who hasn't been voted in, who doesn't really have a specific job, but who's expected to do something, who's not paid for what she's been doing, um, who doesn't get a clothing allowance, it but- sounds like a nightmare. Right, <laughs> but who everybody thinks they get to weigh in on what she's wearing. Right. Uh, so it's just, it's a, a situation that is just ripe for complication. Right, exactly. Exactly. And right, this, the next example that I want to talk about <laughs> is kind of an, is that, you know, um, when first ladies choose to wear non-American designers. So when, um, when, Diane, when you were president of the CFDA in 2011, um, Mrs. Obama wore a dress by the British fashion house Alexander McQueen to a Chinese state dinner and ended up making news because some U.S. designers were upset that she didn't wear an American designer's work. So I want to ask this to both of you guys. Like, what do you think that it is the first lady's responsibility to wear American designed and made clothes? What, I mean, was, the, what was the event for? Well, that was the Chinese state dinner um, where she wore the, oh. uh, the McQueen dress. I see. Well, just in general, though, if do you all think that that it's it's a first lady's responsibility to represent? Well, it's not a. I don't call it a responsibility. I mean, I think you know, it's a, a, you sponsor the the people from, so it's kind of nice. Um, maybe she liked that my queen dress. <laughs> <laughs> And I think I, I, I'm going to I'm going to come down on I'm going to come down firmly on the other side. I think that the American first lady has a responsibility to wear and to celebrate and uplift yeah. the American design industry. Right. I yes. mean, I, I think that yeah, no, when, you're right. You're right. You're you know, right. I, I think that the fa the fashion industry, like the auto industry, like the like any other American industry. Uh, is, uh, you know, needs, wants, deserves the support of the administration. Yeah. And I think if people expect that the presidential motorcade be made up of American made cars, then it also should, yeah, I no, think, right. follow that right. the first lady and the president should yeah. wear American fashion by American designers. Um, and you know, I think there are obviously instances when that's not necessarily the case. For instance, um, you know, Jackie Kennedy famously wore a Givenchy gown when she and the president were on a state visit to France. Mm -hmm. And so I think 
you know, you can, they no, can but, use but, 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 action it, it, as a way of, you know, extending an olive branch, but they are fundamentally representatives of the American people. And they should also represent, I think, American craftsmanship. Right. Diane, do you have something to, to add to that? Well, I think that this, in, in the case of Jackie Kennedy, I mean, it was, you can also take it like she went to France and she chose what she preferred in France. I mean, it was also an act of courtesy, but mm -hmm. um, yeah. I mean, you know, remember Kennedy said, uh, when he, he welcomed, he said, I am the man who accompanied Jackie <laughs> Kennedy in Paris. Right. <laughs> yeah. And she was like a famous Francophile too. So, you know, I guess that was, she, she, she was spoke, very on brand she, in it. She spoke <laughs> French for sure. Right, right, right. So, yeah. oh, go, go ahead, Robin. Oh, no, I was just going to say that, um, you know, I, I think many of the first ladies, Jackie Kennedy certainly um, did this, Michelle Obama, um, you know, did this. They recognize that fashion has the capacity to be a kind of uh, uh, diplomatic language mm -hmm. and they use that. And I think both of them used it very thoughtfully. Um, I, I think other first ladies like Laura Bush, um, you know, chose a specific designer that they really had faith in and they relied on. And I mean, uh, Laura Bush wore in the early on in her uh, White House tenure, um, a lot of Arnold Scazzi and right. she also, which who had designed clothes for her mother-in-law, Barbara Bush. Mm -hmm. um, she wore clothes by Michael Faircloth who had been her designer when she was um, in Texas in the governor's mansion. And then later on, she relied heavily on Oscar de la Renta. So, you know, I think for her and also Hillary Clinton, they found a designer who really sort of, I think, understood what they wanted, understood their, their physique, uh, communicated in a way that they, you know, wanted to, um, to be understood and relied on them. And mm -hmm. then Michelle Obama really sort of, you know, worked her way through the entire buffet no, Michelle, Michelle Obama loves fashion, so she was very, right. she was very much like that. She I was very I welcoming. Yeah. I actually pulled that picture of her in the Balenciaga at, in Brooklyn on the book tour because I, I wish I would have, I wish I would have kept that photo in this because I just think that like you can tell she's having so much fun now that she's out of out of office because it did seem like she was elected, you know. Uh, um, yeah, I mean, I think her style post White House has gone very much, um, has gotten much more personal and much more Michelle Obama as celebrity versus Michelle yeah. Obama as first lady. Yeah. So I want to talk about first lady as trendsetter for a minute. So I feel like, you know, they are perennial inspiration. Um, their styles get mined a lot for for inspiration. And uh, Diane, did you ever use a, a reference of First Lady in any of your collections? Did you draw directly from any First Lady style? No, no any not, 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 not really. I mean, I really, I personally like Jackie Kennedy. You know, I, 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 I don't know, I liked her. So she had style and she, she was a good mother and she worked and, you know, and she had this horrible man. But um, so, but, you know, I, you just think about it, just the idea of being first lady and seeing the first lady as it's just so archaic. Mm -hmm. I, I am not, well, that has nothing to do with it, but do you know where's, what is the most dangerous place for women? No. Where? Robin? I, I don't know. In the home? <laughs> yes. In huh? their own in their own home. Right. That's right. a big thing. It is a big thing. It is a big thing. It's something it's a, that I, I mean it's a big thing. And so even firstly, I mean, it's like what what is expected? That means well, whatever. Right. No, I, I know you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, I think that one of the, the challenges 
is, you know, sort of you're in this, you have this position and you have this enormous platform, this enormous mic, um, megaphone. <coughs> yes. But you're also under an incredible microscope. Right. And, um, you know, it's, it's a really, it's a really fine line that they, they've all had to walk and we've seen, um, you know, the fallout from when they step too far into the world of sort of political policy as happened with Hillary Clinton. And then he's in the beginning of Michelle Obama's tenure when she initially said that she really saw herself as sort of mom in chief, because she was she really wanted to make sure that her daughters sort of got sort of firm footing once they got to the White House. You know, there were a lot of people who saw in her the potential to be this incredible role model and were really disappointed that she didn't announce some massive, you know, policy undertaking, undertaking, you know, right away. So it was a little bit of, you know, sort of damned if you do, damned if you don't, and trying to figure out, okay, how can I balance this? Right, because she goes too far in one direction, too, which is what Hillary Clinton got criticized for. It's like, she, she really can't win. You know, I feel like it, it's it's a, it is a really. But I mean, the just the concept that you're being judged because you're the wife of the president. I mean, if you if you think about it, it's just so. Well, it's funny because I was going to add a question here, and I was I definitely want to bring it up with you guys. It's going to be interesting when we do have a first man. You know, <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> what's going to happen then? Like it's. I mean, that, that will happen sooner, hopefully sooner rather than later. I don't know. But, yeah. Well, well even, it, I think it'll, well, sorry, go, go ahead, Dan. No, no. no I, I, I was just going to say that I think it'll be really interesting. And I was really intrigued when Bloomberg was still in, um, uh, in the midst of his campaign, mm -hmm. mostly because of his life partner, Diana Taylor because she presented such an unorthodox uh, idea of what a quote unquote first lady might be. Mm -hmm. You know, one, they were not married, but they were definitely a couple. Uh, she had this, you know, resume that was really impressive. And it seemed that because she wasn't technically Mrs. Bloomberg, that that allowed her a little bit more freedom and leeway. And I, it was, I thought it would be really interesting to see if that also meant that it would allow her to continue to sort of, you know, do what she does and sit, she sits on boards and she's, you know, is involved with charities. And I thought it would be interesting to see if she could continue to have a life that was unattached to right. the, the president. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, but we're not going to get to get that opportunity. But <laughs> <laughs> well, we but, have a current first lady who is who lives a very independent life. We do indeed. We're going to talk about her in a minute. I'm going to um, now. We've got some photos. I went through and um, brought out some iconic, just different iconic images of, of first ladies. One is. Going back to Jackie Kennedy, it's kind of an extension of the question that we were talking about a minute ago. You know, this is her. She's like the original fashion first lady as fashion trendsetter. And this is her at um, the inauguration in 61 in her Olicassini suit and her Halston pillbox hat. And why do you guys think like why did she set the bar? Like what was it like? And when I started doing this program, I decided that I was going to just concentrate on modern, you know, modern White House, which I think is Camelot on. And I think she has so much to do with that in terms of fashion in particular. So what is it about her style that is so quintessentially American for the ages? Because I think she still gets brought up as, you know, being a style icon. But she was so beautiful. I mean, she was extraordinarily beautiful. And she was I mean, she she was like an American beauty, you know. Mm -hmm. She was like the ideal, and she had the perfect diction. She had the perfect look. She was, yeah, very educated and was kind of you're right, the American ideal. 
Um, Robin, yeah, I would also add that she was she was very young, mm-hmm. and I think that added to the, of course the allure of her as a as a fashion icon. Mm-hmm. Well, you also got those parallels between Michelle Ob- when the Obamas were in the White House and talking, you know, hearkening back to the Kennedys because there were young children there and you know, that same kind of energy that was there. I always, always appreciated drawing the parallels between them. Um, we're now the next photo is of Barbara Bush. Um, you know, we've got Jackie and was associated with her pillbox hat. Mm-hmm. I know Nancy Reagan, people thought of the color red. I'm thinking of these, like these, um, these, these trends that get started or, or um, pieces, accessories that are associated with the first lady. Um, Barbara Bush's Kenneth J. Lane faux pearl necklace was, um, was her calling card. So um, what, Robin, what does that necklace really signify about her? Well, you know, whenever I think of her in, in the necklace, um, I also think about how she used to, or how um, on inauguration evening, she was sort of called the, gr- the glamorous grandmother. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, I think the pearls are very traditional. They're also very um, sort of old world, which spoke certainly to, um, you know, sort of the Bush lineage. Mm-hmm. Um, and they were also to a certain degree, sort of had this element of ladylike demureness to them, Mm -hmm. which I find kind of sort of funny because, you know, that part of uh, Barbara Bush's public persona was of this sort of, you know, grandmotherly, maternal, warm person. And yet she was really known for being someone you did not want to cross that she was tough as nails and a little bit scary, yeah. uh, you know, behind the scenes. And that's not me talking. I mean, that's, um, you know, many, many stories of people who dealt with her. So I thought that she used the pearls as part of this sort of public image in a really smart way. Interesting. It's like a little bit of a, a deflection there. It's, um, next, we have a, this great picture of Pat Nixon that she's standing on a boardroom table in the White House in pants. And, you know, we think of Hillary Clinton in the pantsuits, but Pat Nixon was apparently the first first lady to wear pants in the White House. And I, you know, I brought her into the conversation because the late 60s, early 70s were obviously this big moment of change when when, um, you know, cultural change, but also that was reflected in the style of the times. And uh, the question I wanted to ask is how important is it for a first lady to follow trends, to look current? And what are the pitfalls of that potentially in being too trendy? Well, I mean, I don't, I, I don't, I don't think a first lady needs to be trendy. And I think most people, and I I think it's, you know, if that's not part of her personality and Mm -hmm. character, I I certainly don't think that she should make an effort to do that because Mm -hmm. it will ring very, very false. But I do think that every first lady needs to try to look uh, modern. Right. And by that, I mean, look, looking relevant, looking as if, you know, they are participants in the the culture in which we're living because i think that is a way that they can telegraph that they're connected to the populace yes i mean i i think even when they're wearing something that might be you know out of reach financially for most people there's still this element of you know people wanting them to look like um you know, they're of the, of these times. Right. And I think that that's, you know, it's, it's a very politician type thing where people want to look at themselves when they're looking at the leaders. So being represented in like the look of the first lady is very important. I feel like. Um, So next we have Nancy Reagan on her, on inauguration Eve in 1981 So she, like we were talking about, she did have a lot of designer friends and did borrow and apparently did not give back sometimes. But coming out of the Carter era, which was kind of a steer, um, she brought this style back to the White House. So 
you know, Robin, I wanted to ask you again, what is the significance of this gown, this one shoulder gown? Was that super, super bold on her part? Well, my recollection was that it was a, a Galanos gown and yeah. she wore a lot of Galanos. Um, you know, it was striking because it was very revealing um, mm -hmm. for a first lady. And there, um, you know, were rumblings about whether or not a, a first lady of her age should be wearing uh, a, a one shoulder gown like that. I mean, I think she looked terrific. Um, but it was also just sort of in hindsight, um, interesting that she had worn a gown like that, because in uh, most recently, you know, with Michelle Obama, again, uh, got so much uh, uh, guff about showing her arms. Mm -hmm. And yet, so many first ladies prior to that had done the very same thing. Huh. That's, that's, that's because she had great arms. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, everybody was jealous of her arms. I mean, so that's yeah. why it got attention. <laughs> it's the quality. <laughs> <laughs> they were definitely her most powerful accessory. I will say that. <laughs> like she, she accessorized a dress with those. Yeah. And so, so the next picture is Hillary Clinton in the Donna Karen cold shoulder dress. And Diane, I wanted to ask you about this because um, somewhere along the way, though it was determined that first ladies should not dress overtly sexy. You know, there's, I feel like the message has been like, she should look like she's potentially baking cookies at the same time as she's doing everything else. But um, what does the first lady- I risk mean, the whole thing is just, I mean, I mean, why do we put up with that shit? I mean, it's terrible. <laughs> no, you're right. I, I right. mean, this is absurd. It is absurd, but that's but that's the question. It is no, like, but it's you know. just a question of 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 course anybody should represent who they are, and if they have an official uh, role, they should you know represent and support. Um, the craftsmanship of the of the, of the place that's for sure mm -hmm. but the idea that you shouldn't do this you could be too proper you can't be sexy i mean people should be themselves right. and the best of themselves respecting the job mm -hmm. which is not even a job since they don't get paid <laughs> i don't see any advantage of being a first lady <laughs> I think many of them would probably agree with you. <laughs> yeah, None. She really comes None. out guns blazing talking about how you, great you, you can't win no matter what you do. You, you can't. I mean, that's that really is the message of this whole program, I think. Well, it's like, I mean, okay, okay. I'm going to see the glass as half full. Okay, all right. And, <laughs> and, and I'm going to say that, yes, there are an incredible number of pitfalls. And yet it is also, it can also be an enormous opportunity to make a huge difference in the lives of, you know, millions and millions of people. You can use it as a platform uh, for speaking to those things that are important to you. Um, you can use it in a way that is perhaps in some cases more powerful than it would be if you were an elected official and a, a politician, because you can speak in a way that is nonpartisan. You can speak in a way that is not um, so terribly clouded over with, uh, you know, politics. And, and so I, I think that with all of the downside, um, used well and thoughtfully it can also be a really, really powerful, powerful place to be. That's for sure. I agree with that, for sure. You use for correctly. sure. No, you, no, you're absolutely right. But then, you know, then you, you can talk, we should talk about that. Yes. But this was a fashion story. It's a fashion story, story. yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, it could have been, this could have been many different conversations. But this really is, like, I do think that the message of this program is about, like, that there are these boxes, there's these confines that, you know, we put them in as a society. Like we have these boxes that we want the first lady to fit into. And 
I don't know, exploring those and seeing where people have bumped up against them or tried to change things is really interesting to me. I well, think. well, I think one of the reasons why, uh, you know, Michelle Obama was so compelling for people, not just for the fashion industry, but for just for, for people who were interested in fashion mm -hmm. was that she was very forthright about it. Like she really liked fashion right. and she said she really liked fashion and she embraced that. And she did it in a way that was thoughtful and she used it as a way to communicate. Yeah, absolutely. And she did it in a way that I think in some ways mirrors the way that so many men absolutely. in politics have used sports. Mm -hmm. And they've used that as this, you know, as this sort of this, this interest that connects them, you know, to other people that connects them to average people. And everybody jumps up and down and they celebrate that. And they delight when, you know, a politician talks about their favorite baseball team or does that bracket situation for college <laughs> basketball. And that's wonderful and fabulous and deeply meaningful. And yet fashion, because it's something that traditionally women are particularly enamored with, you know, it gets sort of short shrift. And, you know, I, I think there were a lot of women who appreciated that Michelle Obama said, you know what, this is fun. Right. This is a serious industry. And I'm going to enjoy it. Right. No, no, absolutely. She was, she's great. She's great. You don't have to sell it to me. I love her. <laughs> He's right. great. I mean, he's great. <laughs> it's pretty terrific. So we have next, we have a very, this is like one of the biggest national fashion controversies. I think <laughs> <I've ever heard. laughs> it's a fashion emergency. Um, Melania Trump and her, I don't care. Do you jacket, which um, I'm going to remind everybody she wore to a visit a Southern border at the height of the family separation crisis. I mean, it's, it's just so incredibly insulting that I I, I, I I can't, I mean, I don't get it. Yeah. I think, I mean, like, yeah. I, I don't get it. I, I, I don't get it. Well, this is, you know, I think this is a rare example of, I think this, there was a choice made. Like, you know, the, the press secretary said, this is a jacket, there is no hidden agenda, but we all know that sometimes a jar, Zara jacket is more than just a Zara jacket. It's like, there was a choice made there. And I think it's, there's really very few examples of a first lady really courting controversy. And without getting into a really partisan, <laughs> partisan conversation about it, you know, like, are there, is this, this was really an anomaly, true? I mean, like, I can't think of any other times where I've, I've heard of a first lady really stepping out and making a statement like that with fashion, like literally. Well, I mean, at first, I, I, I thought it was a mistake. I don't know, I thought she didn't know or something. Because you, you can't, you either don't know or you are so engaged in the message, mm -hmm. they're no halfway. I mean, right. right. Robin, do you have thoughts on this? Um, <laughs> I know you do. <laughs> yeah, I do. Luckily, when the, the day she actually wore this, I was on vacation in okay. Zanzibar with really <laughs> internet service. So I was delighted <laughs> to be on the other side of the world when all this went down. Right. Um, I mean, I, to me, her spokesperson, you know, sort of said it all, which mm -hmm. was, there's no hidden message here. There's no, there's no subtext. So my feeling was, okay, take it at face value, which is, I don't really care. And, mm -hmm. you know, over, over the course of what's it, almost four years now, um, I think that in many there have been instances in which that message has been backed up. Mm -hmm. I don't really care. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's striking that, you know, this is an administration that campaign that rode into the white house on the message of make America great again, mm -hmm. America first. Mm -hmm. And this is a first lady who regularly on the most, 
visible high profile events does not put American designers first, right. does not celebrate American fashion. And granted, she, you know, in many cases, there, you know, were designers who did not want to work with her because they had deep philosophical um, issues with the administration. Mm-hmm. But, you know, she's gone out and she has shopped off the rack and she has chosen to not shop American. And, you know, I, I think that when you also look at what she has uh, done with her time in the White House in terms of building uh, a platform, um, it hasn't really uh, come to fruition in the ways that were promised. Uh, right. It still feels very meager and thin. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, you know, and then, you know, recently there were the audio tapes where she uh, was sort of lamenting uh, to um, uh, uh, about assistant that, uh, you know, she was exasperated by having to deal with the White House Christmas decorations and she was exasperated by the way that she was being treated um, in the midst of the family separation issues. And, you know, there was, there was a lot of exasperation in that, in that audio. And, you know, perhaps there was also a lot of enthusiasm that we didn't hear. Um, But there is an issue of, there's just been so much, uh, there's been so much evidence that builds up to support what that jacket said. Right. And not right. a lot yeah. of evidence that has yeah. built up to contradict it. I got you. I got, we, we actually need to probably move on from this, but like, I do want to say, I, I want to move on to some um, student questions. And one of them really feeds into this. Well, um, Ainsley Deaton, who is a fashion student at um, O'More wanted to know some designers have refused to dress certain first ladies. Do you think that designers should take political sides? But is dressing a first lady taking a political side? Well, refusing to dress a first lady for partisan issues. Do you think designers should be nonpartisan, basically? So designers have a, you know, I have have an idea of what you're going to say, but like, should designers take sides? I don't know why it's taking sides. If you're a designer, I mean, you know, I mean, you don't seek for it, you know, but you, but, but saying no, I don't know. Yeah. Um, Robin, do you have any thoughts on that one? Well, you know, I don't, I don't think that designers should discriminate. And so I think that whatever services you offer to Mm -hmm. the general public, Mm -hmm. you should offer to the first lady. Exactly. And if you are a designer who sells your merchandise in, you know, Saks, then you should happily sell your merchandise to the first lady in Saks. If you're a designer who does made to measure, then Mm -hmm. you should do made to measure. Mm -hmm. If you're a designer who does not do made to measure, then I think it's within your right to say, I'm not going to do this special thing. Right. Yes. For this first lady. Exactly. Exactly. I used to run into this when I was dressing, when I was working as a wardrobe stylist down here and dressing country music stars, because it's, it's different, but it's kind of the same. It's like designers would not work with us, you know, because they didn't want to be associated with a, with a country music star. This is 15 years ago. But um, so we would have to buy off the rack. And so we would end up wearing the, the she'd end up wearing the designer anyway. So I feel like that happens some there. It's like people can get access. So it's not like a designer has to take the side. Um, so another question is from Isabella Cabrera. Has there, ever, this is for Diane, has there ever been a time when something you designed received political backlash or have you ever had to deal with a scandal from anything you've ever designed? I use scandal loosely. <laughs> uh, yeah, of course. Um, no, McCain, uh, Mrs. McCain, wore my dresses at the same time as 
Michelle Obama. Mm-hmm. Um, do I have anything scandalous? No. Uh, the first time I went to the White House, I I went with a Holston dress. Oh, love that. A scarf and dress. And, and I danced with President Ford and I didn't, he was fox trotting or whatever, which I couldn't do. And I was losing my dress. So. <laughs> but I have a much better, I have a wonderful story about when I went, um, there was a state dinner for the emperor of, of Japan. Mm-hmm. And so it was Clinton. And I went to the, to the dinner. I was in the middle of a cancer, um, a cancer treatment, in the middle of it, um, radiation. So I had big kind of black, you know, I had stain. It looked like I had a lot of makeup there. And John Galliano, it, it was the first, his first show, and he came and brought it in New York, and he was showing it at the uh, Bergdorf Goodman, which was across from my office. Mm-hmm. And it was a beautiful Chris Curlington dress, pink and, 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 and blue and ruffles and divine. We showed that and, picture earlier. It's gorgeous. And then I, I, and I bought more, sh- more chiffon to do, you know, more of a cover my stall, etc. And I went to the White House and, I mean, I had the best time and I was with my train. I mean, when I came back, the dress that he lent me was, I don't, I can't even tell you what it was. It was nothing left of the dress. <laughs> <laughs> nothing. It's all nothing. Over the White House. <laughs> there was there was nothing, but it was incredible because it was at the very moment that I felt so low. I was in the middle of treatment, you know, all of that, and yet there was this thing and this glamorous moment of, uh, and I was sitting next to Japanese people who couldn't believe that they were in the same house as their emperor. So anyway. No, that's that's wonderful. I think we need to do another program where you just tell us about all the visits to the White House and what you wore. <laughs> I would love to hear that. <laughs> that's be- I love that dress. We did show that picture at the top of the hour because I just I just thought that was so beautiful, and so special. Mm-hmm. So um so I want to I want to end with another question from an Omar student. Chloe James um, wants to know from both of you guys, what's the best career advice you've ever received? And how did that career advice, how did you apply it to help you grow your career? Um, you know, it's, it wasn't really, it wasn't really advice as much as it was uh, a phrase that someone used when I was, doubting whether or not I should apply for a job. Mm -hmm. And uh, she said, it would be a good exercise, which I thought was such a great way of thinking about it because it sort of removed any sense of worrying about failure or being told no, or, you know, sort of looking ridiculous or being embarrassed or something like that. She just said it will be a good exercise. It'll be a good thing. It'll good and the exercise go through the process. And mm-hmm. the exercise years later become experiences. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I think if if you think about sort of each possibility as just sort of as an exercise, mm-hmm. I, I think it reduces the, the stress. stress and everything becomes a learning possibility, a way of just getting stronger and, you know, and becoming uh, sort of better at whatever it is that you eventually end up becoming. Mm -hmm. That's great. Diane, what about you? What's the best career advice anybody ever gave you? Um... It's Diana Vreeland for me. She's the one. Because I showed my, I came and I showed my little dresses and people. And then she, 
genius. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> and and guess what? She she was right. And um, so, yeah, it was. But advice. Oh my God, so many people gave me advice. And um, they were very nice to me when I came to New York. There was Kenny Lane and Bill Blass and Oscar and Nana Vreeland and everybody, you know, was very protective and nice to me. That's so nice. So, okay, I want to flip that around. What's the best advice you guys give people who talk to you about how to grow their careers in your industries. Like um, Robin, when you get aspiring journalists, fashion journalists come to speak to you, like what, what do you tell them to do? What's your best piece of advice? Wow. Well, I don't know. I think my, my advice is kind of wussy. I mean, I, <laughs> I don't know that it's not great. Um, I, I think usually um, I, I tell them two things. One is, I always say, just, just write, mm. even if you're, you're not writing about the subject that, you know, that holds your heart, all writing makes you a better writer. And you never know what you're going to learn from that random story that you think has nothing to do with, you know, fashion, if that's ultimately what you want to write about. Um, but there have been so many times when I've been writing and some, you know, piece of information or, you know, a line from a book that I read, you know, informs um, the story. Mm -hmm. And the other piece of advice I always give is just, there's no magic formula mm. that it's just hard work and preparation and a lot of luck. Right. Yeah, definitely. But definitely talent is in there too. I mean, I think talent's in there too, but like hard work really does get you anywhere. I think really putting that on there. Um, Diane, what about you? What, what career advice do you like to give aspiring designers? I know there's a lot of them listening right now. Um, just go for it. Make sure that Make sure that whatever you do stands for something. I, I don't know. I mean, you know, be honest and and um, everybody. I mean, you know, if you're in fashion, you 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 contribute something. So that something is unique to you. I don't know. Um, and so my best piece of advice is what I would say to everybody. Just go for it. Right. Go, Definitely. Go for it. Yeah. I mean, I think that's like the connecting thing, which is don't, don't try to sound like someone else. Don't try to design like someone else. It's like <laughs> what the thing that you bring that's uniquely you is what will ultimately be the best selling point. Right. And I feel and like last and right. last. last. Yes. Yeah. And that's kind of what I was trying to say with the talent thing too. I think it's like finding what you do, right. Finding what you do well and figuring out how to home in on that and really grow that. Um, I was just for myself, something I always tell, tell people who want to get into fashion in particular is that you can know every dress and every collection that's come out in the last 10 years. But if you really want to like, understand the industry you've got to understand art and you've got to understand politics and you've got to understand new, you've got to understand history and that it's not a one-dimensional um it's not a one-dimensional discipline at all that it's about everything like fashion is about style is about life and um that's something we've been trying to get through in terms of the de demystification of the white house but also really expanding people's ideas of what style is and what influences fashion so, well, I thank you guys so much for this. Um, I, I really appreciate you being here tonight and talking to talking to me and, you know, everybody who's watching tonight, because I know there's a lot of people. Um, I do want to say um, early voting started in Tennessee today. Everybody get out and vote. It's very important um, wherever you are to vote in this election. So, um, yeah, Godspeed. And once you again, you guys are the last debate standing. So, 
I, I know, I know it's going to be, yeah, be, be thinking about us next. It's a big deal. Like Belmont has, has, you know, their flags all over the place. I was over there the other day. They're putting down carpets or <laughs> what big deal. So Nashville's excited to show off again. Finally, it feels good after being kind of, so I can't wait. I will come one day and visit you. You will. We've been talking about that now for 16 years. I've been I mean, there. I know. And the same with Dolly, <laughs> all my, all the people I, I like. All your, all your ladies down here. Well, I'm, I, I promise you when you come down, we will have a humdinger for you. And Robin, you need to come down too. I know you were here last, last year. Yeah, it was too short. It was too short. Yeah. You need the Liddy, the official Libby Calloway tour, which I give to all the, all the fashion media people who come into town. It's, it's, my patented tour. I'm happy to share. Thank you so oh. much for having me. No. Thank you so much. You guys okay, have a great you, night. Bye. Lots of love. All right. Bye. Bye. Bye.